repeating and talking to just one guest each week. Some will join me here in the studio, others I will meet in the privacy of their own home. But regardless of where we meet, I can promise you that they all have a great story to tell. Like my guest this week, who's a household name and a publisher's dream. She sold more than 40 million books worldwide, and with her 19th novel due out later this year, she's no doubt looking at yet another bestseller. When I met her in her beautiful home in Dockey, just outside Dublin, she was as charming and as entertaining as ever. It can only be the irrepressible Maeve Binchy. <laughs> Hello, Gordon. Gordon, welcome back. I haven't seen you. Yeah, I haven't seen you. Haven't seen you. Haven't You've invited us down to your beautiful home, may I say, absolutely beautiful home. But this is the hub. Where do you actually do your writing? Uh, this is this is our, our, our elegant sitting room here now, but we write upstairs. Uh, we have a lovely room upstairs covered in glass. Both Gordon and I write at a, a long table, a big one long table, which a lot of people think is mad that two people could write in the same room. But Gordon, who writes children's books, um, is uh, away in a world of his own where he's busy writing at the moment. He's writing a ghost story. And uh, I'm busy trying to finish up and tie up all these people about the road. And when the two of you are writing there, would you compare notes? Would, would you get involved with his books and he would Not until the end of the morning. We started this rule years ago, which was called the 10 minute sulking time. You know, like drinking up time in a pub. Well, this thing called sulking time, which is that if uh, Gordon says to me, I don't like that uh, character, she's too know-all or goody-goody or something like that, you, you wouldn't sympathise her. I'm allowed to have 10 minutes sulk. And in the sulk I can go outside and I can take the heads off f flowers or I can go downstairs and bang a few saucepans around. And then at the end of the sulk, I either have to say, yeah, sure, you're right, or no, you're not right, but it, it's not allowed to fester. Uh, I mentioned your beautiful house in Dockey, and it's a beautiful village. Uh, you're not here for fashionable reasons, are you? This is, this is your area. I lived in Dockey when my mother and father were alive, when we were children here. And we thought Dockey was the boondocks. We thought it was the most awful place. Everything closed at lunchtime. Uh, the pubs used to close for an hour at half past two. The banks used to close. The hairdressers used to close. Everything used to close. It was the most extraordinary. A very quiet, sleepy hollow. There was one fish and chip shop. Uh, which used to only open, I think, at weekends for the whole time because there wasn't enough business for it the whole, the whole week. When I was in love with Marlon Brando, which was when I was 15 or 16, one of the main disadvantages to our romance blossoming, I thought, was the fact that I lived in Dorky. I mean, I thought every, everything else would have been perfect. I was used to write to him. I used to get my pocket money and I used to spend it on an overseas stamp and I would write to him to tell him to leave this woman, Movita, you know, who was no good for him and was dragging him down and come to, to Dorky and marry me. And every week I'd get a letter back, a picture, a broody picture of Marlon Brando saying, Marlon thanks you for being a member of his fan club. This is ridiculous. I wasn't a member of his fan club. You I, were in love with I was in love with the man and I was offering him this wonderful life that how I would have explained it to my parents had he arrived, I do not know. But anyway, he didn't arrive, and my friend was so consolatory to me, and she was saying, but you listen, maybe if he came here, you'd have to bring him to Dorkey. I know. What a bit of regret. It was just as well he didn't come. And so I sort of thought, well, that was the only good thing about it, that he didn't come to Dorkey. <laughs> and, uh, and nowadays, of course, if the poor man was still alive and he was going to come to Ireland, Dorkey's probably where he'd live. Exactly. Did you come from a privileged background? Because your dad was a barrister, your mum was a nurse. Had you money in, in that sense? We had we had money compared to a lot of other people. We were never we were never flush with money. The house was not very elegant. We were very comfortable. I was the eldest of four, and in those days, uh, you, you know, my mother and father were born in the end of the th were married in the end of nineteen thirties, and in those days. Uh, people didn't, women gave up their jobs, middle class women gave up their jobs, which was a great pity because she would have been a marvellous part-time nurse, you know, she, w she was as practical and good. And my father was a very quiet, uh, bookish man, uh, quite different in uh, many ways from my mother, quite different because he was, um, he hated crowds and my mother would have loved crowds. My mother smoked practically a hundred uh, gold flake cigarettes a day and there's nothing she'd have liked more than to be out in a crowd talking to people. Do I take it you're more like your mum than you are your Well, dad? I think I am, yes. And I, um, I hated going shopping with her because she'd stop and she'd light the cigarette and she'd lean up and she'd talk to people about their business. How dreadful and intrusive, I would think to myself. And I suppose sometimes say or grizzle. 
now I'm exactly the same. You've turned into your mum, I have, have turned into the best. I hope I've got the best parts as well as that marvellous gossipy bit. Well, the really nice thing about my parents was, which I can say my two sisters and brother and I agree about this, that I'm not putting a rosy tinted spectacles on it. They were so, they were so good to us and all they cared about was us. And they thought we were wonderful and they praised us all the time. When I was going to my first dance when I was uh, 17, and I was wearing my cousin's evening dress and my cousin was reasonably big, but she wasn't as big as I was, so we had to let the dress out. And uh, I had diamond earrings, you understand, that I got in Woolworths with little blue sapphires in them. And I'd been practicing putting them on my ears, and my ears had developed two red sores, you see, because of this, the ears. So I put band-aids on my ears, and then I thought they looked awful. So I painted them blue, the band-aids. And the blue was running down my neck, like as if some vampire had bit me or something. I looked absolutely horrific. But I had this long dress on, and I was going to, and my mother said to me, and she meant it. You look so beautiful, she said. You'll take the sight out of their eyes. And so I went to the dance, delighted with myself. And again, the facts did not support this. <laughs> and I didn't have a great time at the dance. But when I came home, I told them I was danced off my feet. Because I couldn't bear that they would feel that their investment uh, had been turned out to be such a disaster. Were you brought up in a fairly strict Catholic background? Well, it's, I'm, it's uh, interesting to think about that because it was strict in the sense of that you would as soon walk down the road naked as not go to Mass on a Sunday. Uh, if they, they we, and we sometimes said the rosary at night, but not always. Sometimes it was like a little bad habit. You'd get out of it three nights running and then you'd forget. And suddenly it would fall into dissuade for some months until my mother would suddenly say, we haven't said the rosary for a long time. And we'd start it again. We'd play at the end of it, Three Hail Marys for the conversion of Russia. And, uh, and that worked too. But has that Catholicism, has it stuck with you throughout your life or have you... Not in the form. Not in the, it hasn't stuck with me in the form of, of it is. I believe there must be something uh, afterwards. And I, I think to me it's amazing to come into this world and have a fantastic, um, uh, all the richness and excitement and life and then for it all to fade away. I feel sure there must be something afterwards. When you went to UCD, did, did you have any idea what you wanted to do? Oh yes, I was going to be a judge. There was no career guidance in the schools then. And then, but so when I went to UCD, I also d started to read for King's Inns uh, to, to be a barrister. And I, it was a bit different than what I thought. It wasn't nearly as nice. It was terribly, terribly detailed and precise. So I thought, well, I better do something else. So I thought I could be a teacher. And I only went into teaching for, for, um, for, for, for wanting something else to do. Was your father disappointed that you didn't have no. I think he was very relieved. He, he was, I think he was very relieved, and he said to me, and then he said, he said to me, I hope you won't dislike teaching. And of course, I was about 20 minutes into teaching when I realised what I was born to do. There, top of the classroom, wearing a black cloak, uh, swooping down on them, no trouble keeping any discipline, because I was about twice the size of everybody in the room, uh, booming voice, everything uh, that a teacher needed to be. And then in 1968, my mother had died the year before, and I was thinking, you know, we were all very unsettled, really and truly, of course we were. And I, I was thinking, I'm going to be in this job forever. I'm going to be in this job till I'm 65, and I'll never know if I could have done something else. So I said to my father, would you mind if I gave up teaching just for a year? There was no career breaks back then. You couldn't take a year off. I was offered a job by the Irish Times. And so that was such a lovely thing. Then I got a great job in the Irish Times, which was as woman editor. And that was amazing. When I went for the intervi interview, they asked everything except about my typing because they had seen all these lovely, beautifully typed uh, uh, things I had sent in to, the, to them. But the reason why they, they were beautifully typed is I had paid for them to be typed. I had invested yeah. four shillings or six shillings for them to be typed in the hope of getting four guineas, you know, for them. And I couldn't type at all. I thought it took a year to learn to type. And so anyway, at the end of the first day, I had all my page ready, and I said to some of the people near me, who, who types this? And so a terrible silence fell on everybody. And they were awfully good colleagues. They all typed a page each for me. <laughs> and then they said, you better learn to type this weekend. And I learned to type in the weekend. And I'm afraid it still shows that anybody who ever got a letter from me that I learned. I can't type the word I'll, I apostrophe, LL. I always type 1811, because I never <laughs> hit the thing to, 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 to do it properly. But, but it was lovely. And I worked in the Irish Times for, for five years as woman editor. You then went to London, and you worked for the paper in London. Yes, I went in hot pursuit of Gordon to London. Um, uh, did you know Gordon before you went I to did, London? I did, yes. Where did you meet Gordon? I met him in the BBC club in London with some friends. I, was, I did a piece for a radio program on Woman's Hour, and Gordon was a friend of the producer. And we had, um, uh, he seemed an awfully nice chap. We went out to, to dinner and then one day I said to him, do you know what, what I think is lovely about living in London, that you have, you could go to 
to France for lunch and come home. And so the next time I went to London, he took me to France on a hovercraft for lunch. And she, then I got much fonder of it. I thought that this is an unsuitable romance because he lives, he lives in London and there's been no work for him in Ireland. So, I mean, you know, he'd never come over here. It was 1973 and it was a time of troubles and um, the editor wanted people, to, somebody to go to London to write about features in general, not about politics and hunger strikes and bombs and uh, court cases, but just to write about life in general, not demonising things. So I suddenly thought, wouldn't that be great? So um, I moved over uh, in, uh, to London and Gordon and I got together and got married. I'm very, very sorry my parents never knew him. They would have been astonished, I think, even with their delight for me that I would have found somebody so nice. One of the women in uh, works in a shop in Dorky said to me one day, uh, I don't know how you're looking at me, I don't know how you got such a nice man like that. Like, you know, I mean, the kind of the <laughs> element, element of treachery and lies obviously was involved. And I said, uh, your mother must be praying for you to have got somebody as nice <laughs> as that. And so I, mean, I came home humbly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't realise. <laughs> how wonderful you are. And how unequal we are. <laughs> I read, uh, I don't know whether you said it or not, but it's attributed to you. You said that uh, you were married too late for children, but not too late for happiness. That's right, yes. And in those days, it wasn't as easy to have, uh, uh, there wasn't all the fertility guidance and help that there is now. And it was in its early days. So we, we realised we weren't going to have children. Did you want children? We would both have loved children, yes. Is it a, a regret to this day? No, because we decided we'd have to cope with it. We'd have to cope with it then. And we were too old to adopt, you see. Uh, once you get over 40, you couldn't adopt. So uh, we decided then we would make other people's children our children. And we've had several families, some of them relations, some of them friends. As we said, that's something we want. We want really to be involved with your children. You must lend them to us. And, get, and now we've we'd had great times. And those children are all now married, so we have grandchildren. And I'm talking about sort of about nine or ten children whose lives have we've been very involved. It's not as good because obviously anybody who would would want to have uh, a child with somebody they love and be sure that that, that would be the, the best thing that, that that could be. But you can form huge bonding and attachment to other people's children. It was the time when you discovered this, this wonderful talent. Uh, your first attempt was a book of short stories in Central Line. Was yeah. that an immediate success? It sold 5,000 copies, which was, was quite good Amazing, for an unknown yeah. person. But the second book, Victoria Line, only sold 3,000. Uh, and even I, with my sunny Pollyanna optimism, realised <laughs> the chart was going in the wrong <laughs> direction at this stage. And then uh, I had an agent, and she had an agent at this stage, and she said, I think what you should do is try a big, long novel. I said, which they, they wouldn't, they're not going to be reading the short stories and never take on a 500-page book. And she said, well, that's what people seem to like. So then I wrote, I said, well, give it a try. And in a year, I wrote Life's Pin Candle. And, and absolutely everything changed. Bingo. Ab do you remember the phone call from the public? I do remember them because Gordon was out. Uh, and he was out, it was, it was um, a Friday afternoon and there was an auction like a, a, a for, the, for the paperback rights of Life's Penny Candle. Now, I, he said they'd already paid me £5,000 to write the book, which was huge. And so I thought what were you earning at the time? About uh, 11000 right, pounds so a year. Half a year's half a year salary. salary for something that I had got up at 6 o'clock in the morning to write. So I thought this was money for a rope. And then uh, the next thing um, I said, uh, they said, it was going to be auctioned as a paperback because four or five paperback houses wanted to buy it. So I said, and will I come to the auction? I thought it was going to be like a thing where they sold carpet. You know, yes. they held it up. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's all done by phone. Uh, you stay, you stay where you are, and we'll tell you when when uh, they uh, went. Up. So I was at home, and Gordon uh, was out, as I said to you, and I was standing in the hall. And the phone rang, and they said, "We've had the auction." And I said, "Yes." And he said, "Are you sitting down?" The publisher said, and I said, "Yes, I wasn't." He said, "No, you're not. Go and sit down." So I sat down the stairs, and he said. You got fifty eight thousand pounds, and I said with my voice shaking, "And do I get the fifty six fifty eight thousand pounds, or do you?" And he said to the publisher, "I'm very much afraid you do." And I was absolutely fantastic. And so, uh, so when Gordon came home, I said, "I have the most amazing news. I have the most amazing news." I remember we danced around our house in 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 London, and uh, he said, "Isn't that fantastic?" So that that was wonderful. It just did change our lives. Success followed success, and it made you a lot of money. How do you feel about money? Well, you see, I was very lucky because I was 43 when we got the money. And uh, by 43, I knew what I wanted in life. And it wasn't anything to do with jewellery or yachts or high society or, uh, you know, anything like that. It was, I'm, 
never been interested in, in hugely smart clothes or uh, being well dressed as things like that. I couldn't find clothes to fit me in a shop, even if I if I was interested in them. So there, so there were none of those things. It's the freedom from worry is the real That's thing. The, the freedom class. from worry is wonderful. No, you, you've taken the fame easy and, and your feet are on the ground. Do you do you see yourself as, as a literary figure? Oh no, no, no. I see myself quite seriously and want would always want to be remembered as a storyteller. I don't think I have any style of writing. I write exactly as I talk. I write exactly as I talk and I don't, uh, I don't wonder, well does this sentence look nice or would it be better another way? And I never know when I'm talking, when I'm talking to you now, I have no idea how this sentence is going to end. And I mistrust people who know how their sentences are going to end. I think somebody who knows how the sentence is going to end is what they'd call in Dublin a cute whore. And that, that, that they're, they're in it for some reason of their own. It, I, I, most of us who, who talk normally, it, it, a sentence comes to its natural end. I can't end. believe you write like that. I do, I do, yes, I do write just as quickly as that. Uh, you have one vanity, because they're making Tara Road into a movie. And you wanted to be in it. Oh, I did. How vain is that? That's about as bad as it gets. I was, uh, w when they were making the movie of Tower Road, I was hoping uh, that we could have a little tiny little Hitchcockian appearance in it. So I asked the director if we could have it, and he's very nice. He said, I'll take up a shot for you to be in. So he has um, had a little scene where Gordon and I would be sitting drinking a martini in, um, in, in a, at a restaurant, and the camera would pick us up, and Stephen Ray, the actor, would serve us a martini, and then Stephen Ray would inexplicably leave us and go on t to talk to the main stars and then it, it came back we weren't to we weren't to um to talk we were just to sort of mouth our thanks for the martini and i could see the lovely frosted glass and the olive and i said to gordon i couldn't murder that martini and he said i think you're being a bit optimistic it is only half past nine in the morning i said they have to have a martini but he was right it was a glass of warm water with an olive in it one of the most enjoyable things you told me that's happened to you is your portrait that's hanging in the National Gallery. When somebody said well, they want to paint your own picture for the National Gallery, I did think this was a step too far. And then they sent this nice girl who's a portrait painter uh, to be called Maeve McCarthy, and she'd won prizes and competitions and everything. So day after day, about we had about 14 sittings, I think. I had to go around and look at it, but my face was like a blur. It was all like... You know, I think the word is pixelated, yes. but they put little squares yes. on it. Uh, like when they to cover it, somebody's an accused or a criminal and don't want to identify them. And I said to her, it's, it's just my, my, my face I was wondering about. And she said, oh, I'm not going to paint your face. She said, and I thought, well, maybe I've misunderstood this. I thought if your portrait was being painted, that's what they did paint. But she said, no, I'm not going to paint your face now. I'll do it at the end. So at the, at the end, she just put in the face, like in one day, as far as I could see. And I was delighted with it. And uh, people who um, have seen it, and my family are of it too, they all said it was like it was extraordinary. My mother, who's dead for so long, but that my, her eyes were just exactly, that, exactly really? uh, like my mother's eyes. And I'm very pleased with that. And that's, uh, it would be so marvellous if my parents could come back for a day and I could take them into the National Gallery and say, wait till I show you. Wait till I show you. It's about as great an honour that your country can give you. I, I, I was bowled over by it. That's made you proud. Very proud. How would you like to be remembered, Maeve? Is there, is there one way you would like to be remembered rather than another? Or well, what? I do always say I don't know how. I don't want uh, necessarily want a tombstone. I, 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 I think I'd like to have. Um, uh, I, I w I'd like a very, 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 very noisy and uh, upset funeral with everybody weeping their heart out and completely unrestrained grief. I don't want anybody being kind of strong about it. I want people to be helpless with, with, with upset. And I'd like Liam O'Flynn to play the pipes at it, you know. I've asked him about this and he said that he, he would, he hoped he'd be a nice old man, that he wouldn't be, uh, uh, he, he would hardly have any breath in him, but he would play the Dylan pipes. I've given him a few numbers that I'd like to play. I said, things that would be real tear jerkers. I had a fantastic time here, you know, I really had a better time than anyone deserved and I was extremely happy uh, and I'd love people to know that, that I wasn't putting it on or putting a good face or anything, I was extremely happy. I'd ex I had a wonderful family who were so kind and loving to me, I had all the success I needed in my career and uh, when I was in my mid-thirties and thought that I was past love, I met a marvellous man to whom I've been married for th almost 30 years. So I mean, if, 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 I, if I start complaining, you know, really and truly I should be taken out and shot. We have been a storyteller. It's a pleasure talking to you. Give us a kiss, start. <laughs> the charming Mia Vinci. You know, she really is a national treasure. Right, that's it for Jerry Meets this week. I do hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back at the same time next week.